Uh, good afternoon, fellow Democrats. Great to be here with you. I want to thank Donna Brazil for taking on this responsibility during a very challenging time in our party's history. I feel like the luckiest person on the face of the earth. I had the privilege, a, a son of Dominican immigrants, growing up in Buffalo, New York. I never would have dreamed that I would have had the opportunity, a kid who got Pell Grants in school, uh, worked on the back of a trash truck, to have the opportunity of a lifetime to work for the likes of Ted Kennedy, to work for the likes of uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, and do all of those things and be an organizer. And you know what? What they allowed me to do is put my values into action, day in and day out, to fight every day. And I did a lot of fights here in Arizona. Thank God Joe Arpaio is your former sheriff. Thank God SB 1070 is no longer the law of the land. And I have a history of doing that for fighting to get 218 votes on the floor of the House of Representatives to, to rebuilding a party in the heart of the South. That is what I will do as DNC chair. So I have very few titles, and I am super proud of that. I am one of the workers of our party, just like you are the workers of our party. I'm running for the chair of the DNC because I have demonstrated an ability to see Democrats get elected. There are no statewide Republicans in Minnesota. And the reason why, the reason why is because I have turned up the vote and the turnout in the 5th Congressional District. I ran the DNC's women's office. I ran the Southern Political Director's desk. I ran Rock the Vote and turned out the highest percentage of young people between two presidential elections ever recorded in history. And then I took all of that knowledge, built on the backs of that training that the DNC gave to me, and I've spent the last seven years fighting the good fight in the belly of the beast at Fox News. The week I got into the race for mayor of the city of South Bend, Newsweek had us on a list of 10 American dying cities. And I am proud to report that just five years later, our city is seeing the fastest population growth in over a quarter century. Why? Because we held ourselves accountable for real concrete results because we worked on the ground, we did the unglamorous blocking and tackling that is actually needed to get things done. That is the mentality of a mayor and that is the mentality I would like to bring to the DNC. Washington is not the answer, it's not where the message is going to come from, it's not where we're going to come uh, winning from. It is going to be the local communities. One neighbor talking to another neighbor is the single most powerful tool we have and you look at the polls, the American people support our agenda, they just didn't hear it because we're too busy running TV ads and sending mail to people that are going to throw it in the trash, as Jamie said. The reality is we just take a small percentage of that money, invest it in every single state, in every single county, in every single neighborhood, and we will start winning offices up and down the ballot throughout this country, and we will reject Donald Trump, we'll win back the majorities, and we'll win back the states. It is simple as that. Our message is hope and opportunity. It always has been, always will, but we stopped talking about it. We stopped giving people hope and opportunity because we weren't able to get real people talking to other real people. We have done that in New Hampshire, and that's why Kelly Ayotte is no longer a United States Senator. Uh, obviously, there are still some hard feelings, uh, uh, probably among some of these folks, about what happened in, in the primary uh, for, for uh, president, uh, the Sanders faction versus the Clinton faction. How do you get beyond that? As the chairman of the party, what do you do? And let me, let me start in the, in the middle this time. I bet no one says that about you too often, Congressman. But uh, let's, let's, let's start with you. You know, uh, as I pointed out a moment ago, and all of us know, Donald Trump is about to be sworn in as President of the United States. We have to come together in unity across all of our different points of view. I supported both candidates, one of the primary and one of the general, and I was proud to support both of them. I'm proud of both of them. I just want to say, and I just want to say that, you know, I went to multiple states for both, and I was glad of it. Now, I just want to say that, you know, part of unity is being a chair who will go where people are conflicting and help them sort out the conflict. When I went to uh, uh, the uh, breakfast uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia for Nevada, I had good friends in there who were on different, different pages. And so 
they, I tried to mediate sort of a little bit, and they said, well, you come to Las Vegas and help us talk about how we get on the same page. And I said, I will. And I did. And we sat in a room for five hours, talking about different points of view, hearing people out, responding, and we came out with a document that everyone signed that allowed for unity. And then the Nevadans went out there and won for Hillary. That's great. So let me tell you, we all, we got a fight ahead of us. We got to come together, and we will. And if I'm the chair, I not only will preach unity, teach unity, I will go where people are conflicting to bring us together. Thank you. It was my job to make sure that we got 218 votes for any bill that came on the floor. Working for Mr. Clyburn, working for uh, Leader Pelosi, uh, working for Steny Hoyer and all of the leadership then. Well, that, that 200, we had 233 members. We could only lose 15 votes on any given legislation. And at that time, we had 40 blue dog Democrats from the South. We had about 30 some odd new Dems. We had about 80 or 90 some odd progressives. You only got 15 votes that you can lose legislation. So that meant we had to go to places where Democrats, instead of seeing the blue as a Carolina blue, they maybe saw it as a dark blue, blue, right? And so they didn't always see the world in the same color. But we always had to get them all on the same page to pass legislation. We did not lose one party line vote in those two years when I worked in the whip operation. And that's because we respected people. We understood that sometimes the vote that you take in, in a, a vote that you take might not float well in North Carolina that could work well in California and vice versa. That is the type of mentality that we have to have in our DNC chair to understand that diversity is our greatest strength as a party, but it also creates issues and conflicts and challenges. But if we could focus on the things in which we do well and that we all agree upon and use that as the foundation for how we move forward, then this party becomes okay. united. Right. I see a lot of false choices, and I'd like to sound a warning about some of the false choices being presented to us as a party right now, that we have to choose between one wing of the party and another, or that speaking to white working class voters somehow means abandoning the moral foundation of racial justice that makes our party what it is. Those are false choices. I know when you start, especially when you're introducing yourself, people want to fix you on a spectrum or they want to fit you in a category. Uh, maybe just my personal experience makes me inclined not to go for that. I'm a church-going, red state, millennial, progressive, anti-gun collecting, <laughs> intellectual war veteran. I, 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 I don't fit in anybody's categories, and most Americans don't think of themselves, and most Democrats don't think of themselves as fitting so tidily into the categories that sometimes are laid out for us in stories. We've got to rise above because our values are the right values, and when we lead with those values and back them with a formidable on-the-ground organization, we will win everywhere, every time. We can confront this head-on and not feed them exactly what they want, like they were fed in the 2016 elections exactly what they wanted and delivered Donald Trump upon this earth. But to get to UNITY, we also have to have real conversations, real engagement, a real discussion about the common values, the shared values we have between people who are on one side of this perceived divide and on the other side. Now, when Bernie Sanders wanted to run for president, Secretary of State of New Hampshire in the spring of 2015 said, no, he's not a Democrat. I said, yes, he is. He said, no, he's not. I went to the ballot law commission, got him put on the ballot. And when he filed in the New Hampshire primary, I went with him because I wanted to make sure in front of all of the press that was there that the Secretary of State of New Hampshire accepted his filing and said, yes, indeed, his name was going to be on the ballot. That's what a neutral party chair does. That's what I'll do as DNC right. chair. The thing I hear the most in my conversations with DNC members is that you want to be part of a team. You don't want to simply be spoken to. You don't want to have a command and control structure. You want to be part of the decision making. We can enhance our everything we do by doing just that, our organizing. We've got to organize, 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 and we do it better when we do it together.
making sure we tackle the scourge of voter suppression in this country. When we do it together, we do it better. And that is why I have called for the creation of a dedicated unit to do just that. I propose we have, at minimum, a monthly DNC call with the chair, maybe more, but at least once, at minimum a regional call, and at min a month, and at minimum a live stream where we talk directly to the Democratic base. Where we go to the rank and file Democrat. You know the one who's trying to raise two kids and feed them? The one, you know, the folks who are trying to make sure that Social Security doesn't get cut? You know, the ones on the college campus? You know, the ones trying to just make sure that they can get by and are looking for a champion in the Democratic Party to fight for them? Those people, we can use technology to do it. But I want to say I'm impressed with much of what my colleagues have said. I think there's a little bit of the answer in everything everyone said. Rhetoric is defeated by relationship. Relationship defeats rhetoric. And we've got we to make that real, everybody, by going door to door. Thanks. We need to promote people-powered politics. To do that in the spirit of President Obama, who said in his farewell address, when trust in public institutions is low, we must reduce the corrosive influence of money in politics. Will you support a resolution to revive President Obama's ban on corporate donations to the DNC and a ban on having the chair appoint corporate lobbyists as at-large members in favor of diverse grassroots Democrats? All right. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. Thanks, so I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> I've already gone on record in, in the media as having said I absolutely will. I think the number of at-large members that we have um, is really unfortunate. Um, that gives a lot of power to a chair who makes all of that appointments, and I think we need to decentralize power. I will say, for me, this issue is about access. There are all sorts of pieces of my plan that talk about access because what we really need to do is make sure that everybody has equal access, whether you're a homeless person with not two pen pennies to rub together or whether you're somebody who is very influential and has a lot of money, you need to be able to talk to the chairwoman, right? And so in my plan, I say specifically that the chair needs to set up da daily appointments with people who are not influencers and who are not donors, who are just great Americans with great ideas that they want to talk to the chair of the party. My question is, if you are elected chair of the DNC, will the budget of the DNC be a secret to DNC members and the members of the executive committee and the vice chairs? Okay. So. I understand that this is a simple yes or no question. The chances of any of you giving a simple yes or no is about zero. I myself don't know all the inner workings of the DNC. I'm on the outside looking in. But I can certainly tell you that uh, transparency and accountability will be a priority if I'm elected chair. No, it should not be a secret. Yes, we should have transparency. <laughs> all right. I'm the vice chair of the DNC. Uh, one of them, uh, as ASTC president, I have no more idea than the person sitting in the back on where the money is spent at the DNC or how much is raised. It is absolutely ridiculous. The officers need to get monthly reports, the executive committee quarterly, and the, the annual report to the full DNC. The officers weren't even told that we took out millions of dollars worth of loans just before the election. We had no idea. 